Thank you. Actually, before I start, rarely do we see things so full, so I am going to take. <laughs> Those of you who come to my courses will probably get used to that kind of thing. Um, it's really wonderful to see so many people here. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, rarely have we seen this room or any of the rooms so full. And I know it's a squeeze for people, um, but it's, it's so fantastic to see people supporting the seminar series and interest in the topics we're dis uh, discussing. So, you know, a formal welcome to the 2016-2017 Development Studies Seminar Series and to what I know is going to be a very exciting, uh, interesting and debate-provoking set of talks, not just this evening, but throughout uh, the series as a whole. And as Fazius says, has already said, this year is particularly important to us because it's not just the 100th anniversary of SOAS as an institution, important though that is, of course, but it is our 25th anniversary of development studies being taught at SOAS. The original development studies programme started off uh, as a fairly small programme taught in the geography department, uh, before being incorporated into the Department of Development <coughs> Studies that was established 20 years ago. Um, and thereafter, it was run alongside the growing range of uh, master's programmes that we've developed. And we've since grown over that 25 years and the 20 years of the department immensely, both in terms of the number of staff, the number of students, and the number of programmes that we're offering. So alongside that existing joint BA Honours in Development Studies, we now have a new full BA Honours Programme in Development Studies. We have seven master's programmes plus a number of other pathways within existing programmes. And of course we have a very strong uh, and very popular research degree programme. And our research, while disparate in nature and topic, has synergies throughout the department through the research clusters and through events like this that bring us together to explore the common themes and issues throughout our work. And I've said this before to the masters uh, or to the, the, the postgraduate students at our induction event, but I, I think it's essential that we remind ourselves that the subjects and issues that lie at the core of development studies as a discipline, as a subject, are among the most important facing the world today. Issues around inequality, the uneven impacts of globalization, uh, issues around violence, conflict, and the transition to peace, the power and politics of international organizations, the purpose and effectiveness of aid, social movements, non-state actors, <clears throat> and civil society, questions of formal and informal labor, and climate change and, resources, and natural resources. And these have been at the heart of our teaching, our research, and our engagement and collaboration with global networks of scholars and policymakers for the 25 years that development studies has been taught at SOAS. And I think particularly within Britain at the moment, with the right turn that we're seeing in government policy towards Europe, and the wider world, a declining commitment to internationalism, with the government's demands for lists of non-UK workers, its restrictions on students and also academics uh, coming to UK universities, whether to study, uh, to do research, or just to visit and give talks. The government's refusal to engage with non-British experts in the framing of policy, with the Minister of development, International Development, who doesn't seem very committed to the very existence of our own institution. And in a world where ever more seem enthralled by those who dissemble, obscure, and reject the notion of evidence and data, what we have done and what we do over the past 25 years and in the future has perhaps never been more important. And these seminars, this seminar series, is an important reminder of those ideas and those values, drawing on the knowledge and research of the world's best in their fields, encouraging dialogue and debate. And they're part of the commitment that development studies will remain at the heart of what SOAS does for not only the next 25 years, but far, far beyond that. I'll allow Costas to introduce our first speaker, but I'm really looking forward to tonight's talk and, of course, to those that come. So welcome to our first seminar, and please keep coming throughout the year. It would be wonderful to see all of the seats and all of the steps filled throughout the rest of this series. Thank you very much. Um, 
Many of you will know already who, um, who Professor Anwar Sheikh is. Um, he's one of the world's leading heterodox economists. He's professor of economics um, at the New School in uh, New York. Um, and he's also associate editor of the Cambridge Journal um, of Economics. And he's written widely on trade, uh, finance theory, uh, political economy, welfare, the welfare state, um, inequality, and uh, past uh, and current global economic crisis. He's written on much more um, and uh, he's, uh, yeah, we're, we're going to have questions afterwards, so you can uh, save your questions uh, for the end. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's uh, not only an honor, but it's a pleasure to be back at SOAS. I came here in 1998 to start to work on this book. I also got married here in London uh, in that same year, so this is an anniversary in, in many senses for me. The book took a long time, um, but anyway, I'm so happy to be back. I'm happy to talk to you about it. I'm happy to see so many people interested in development issues and a critical approach to uh, development and to economic analysis. My interest in development stems from the fact that that's how I started. I started as a graduate student coming from Pakistan to Colombia, and I was interested in development economics. And I discovered something utterly shocking, which is that the theory that I was presented with bear no resemblance to any society or any human behavior that I could see and I'd ever seen. Uh, and I was told that, well, that's a standard theory, and you apply it. And I said no. I, I refuse um, to accept that this is a foundation, so I refuse microeconomics and the macroeconomics built on conventional microeconomics. But I took up the, the task of trying to find a framework within which these same questions could be addressed. Because it doesn't do any good to say, well, their construction is not any good, but I don't have an answer for that. If you don't think it's any good, then you, it's your responsibility to have an answer for the same things. And so my book is dedicated to trying to provide a framework that is consistent and coherent and can cover a wide number of subjects, I'm going to run through some of that shortly, uh, that we have to deal with in economics. But this book is focused on the developed world. And there's a reason, a tactical reason, historical reason for that. When I was studying development economics, I was told, well, the Treatment of the developed world is well established and we all know it and you have to learn it and so you have to apply that. But I thought that treatment was completely rubbish. So therefore, applying it made no sense to me. So I needed to have a framework in which the uh, analysis of the center was done. Now, it's not that I invented that. I actually excavated that. Because if you think about it historically, and perhaps you know the history of economic thought, you know how this came about, but the early studies of uh, analysis of capitalism from Adam Smith, David Ricardo, Marx, and then Keynes and Kalecki also subsequently, were attempting to grapple with a real system, an actual living, adapting, organically changing system, and they were trying to find out certain intrinsic structural properties and motivations that were deep there. So if you read Smith, you will see that it's still relevant today. You read Marx especially, you'll see it's still relevant today, but also Ricardo. But around the 19th century, uh, the mid-19th uh, century began to develop a school of thought that was not interested in representing capitalism, it was interested in idealizing capitalism. And it is from this root that you get perfect competition, perfect knowledge, perfect consumers, subsequently rational expectations and the standard macro theory. It's a consistent and coherent line, and in my opinion, it's a consistent and coherent misrepresentation of the reality. Um, and if that's the case, then I have to try to persuade you that you, we, of course you have to study it, of course you have to understand it, and of course you have to understand those critiques of it, such as post-Keynesian economics, which I will come back to. But I believe that it's necessary to have a foundation from the start that is based on real behavior. So the book is focused on real microeconomics, real consumer behavior, real theory of the firm, which I call real competition, and then the macroeconomics, which 
then uh, uh, based on these foundations comes, uh, presents a particular set of uh, understandings of the world and some understandings of some constraints. Now, I should just parenthetically say that it's not, I didn't come to this because I had bad teachers. I had the best teachers. My microeconomics teachers, both of them won Nobel Prizes in economics for microeconomics, Bill Vickery and Gary Becker. Uh, my macroeconomics professor was the advisor to uh, Eisenhower, the head of the Council of Economic Advisors, Arthur Burns. My teachers of trade were Ron Finley and Peter Kennan, the stars in their field. Um, and these are people, some of these people I was very close to personally, but I still believe that the framework from which they started was wrong. Not just inadequate, not just modifiable, but wrong as a starting point. So the question that that leads to is, if that's the question, well, how do you begin afresh? And the first thing to understand is that when it comes to consumer behavior, we know that people are complicated. We know that people are social animals. We know we, that we are influenced by what others think and do and by uh, messages, subliminal and explicit, by social pressures, by emotions, by uh, patriotism, by nationality, ethno, ethnic and racial identities. We know that and it's, it shouldn't come in as an something that you add on, it should be from the start. So if you want to start with proper understanding of human behavior, start with anthropology, start with psychology. Not the psychology nowadays, which is kind of wiggling its way into neoclassical theory, but real psychology. Start with the analysis of how people behave. Of course, you should read history, and of course, you should understand how politics influences us. So then you face a problem. If we know that people behave in very complex ways and with very interactive ways, how do we characterize that? Well, let me start by saying that I'm going to try and show you that that perfectly allows us to derive all the laws of microeconomics of consumer behavior, down the sloping demand curves, uh, elasticities of, of demand of, uh, of, for necessary goods and luxury goods, income elasticities, uh, the consumption function, all of that can be derived from the foundation of real behavior. But I want to stop for a moment and say, isn't it odd, isn't it bizarre that when you go into a microeconomics course, you're presented with an image of a human being that is anti-human, non-human? What is a utility curve? It's a preference structure, right? It's shaped a particular way to make the story come out right. If it's shaped differently, it doesn't work, and the, the, the shaping is done to make the answer right. But what does it say? It says that every individual is concerned as consumers and as choice makers with one thing only, which is things. Marx calls this ex commodity fetishism. It's an extreme form of commodity fetishism, if you've read Marx, where people are uh, represented as caring only about things. Now, think of what that means. If you get some more of one thing, according to utility theory, you're better off. That make any sense to anybody? What if that came from my mother? What if it came from my children? What if it came from my tribe or my nation? Is it really true that what I get is the only measure of how I care or how I make decisions? I don't know of any theory of human behavior except economics that makes such a bizarre claim. And the point is that we don't need to make that. If you allow for the fact that you do care, that it does matter, that you respond to stimuli, uh, actual and hidden stimuli, that you re respond to emotions and angers and love, all of that, you can still derive all the laws and we're no longer trapped in this strange island of isolation and sociopathology that we call economic man. By the way, economic man is usually Robinson Crusoe. I don't know how many people know, I've read Defoe, Daniel Defoe. Robinson Crusoe was a slave trader. That's how he happened to be on the island. He was taking slaves for a second trip back from Africa to, I think it was Brazil. The ship was shipwrecked and he landed on an island. Is that really the model that we want for human behavior? A slave trader? Um, 
Know your history, know your economics, and also know that once you leave that behind, you can develop an analysis, and I'm gonna to start to show you how that works. So if the center of the whole story of economics is how markets work, right? I mean, that's the whole point. One side is the consumer behavior, and I've already said that standard beginning is absolutely invalid. But the other side is the theory of the firm. Now, what determines the theory of the firm? The answer given by every economic tradition is that firms are motivated by profit. So we say that competitive firms are motivated by profit and they also compete with each other. But then again, in orthodox economics, firms don't compete with each other. <coughs> firms take a price as given, they have perfect knowledge of all the possibilities and outcomes, and they passively uh, adjust their output to maximize their profit. In real competition, and you don't have to believe my book, go to Harvard Business Review, you will see that what firms do is they set prices. Of course they set prices. Who's gonna set prices? You walk into a shop, it's not Walt Ross's auctioneer who went by and put stickers on there. It was the people who work in the shop. And if it doesn't work, then they don't sell the goods and they adjust the price. So the price is a signaling device by individual firms. And other firms recognizing that compete with them. If your price is too high, then they'll, next door or down the block, they'll say sale, 25% off, and guess where you'll end up going? Of course, that's, their job is to undercut each other. Their job is to compete. From that point of view, real competition is a war. It's not the ballet that you get presented with people optimizing and dancing around to nice harmonious music. This is a war, and the point of war is to kill your opponent. That's the point. So the history of firms and history of, of competition is a history of conflict among individual firms. Conflict also between industries because they have industry interests. Conflict between nations because nations have economic interests also. So conflict enters right in the beginning. But yet in the heart of this conflict is another conflict which we will know historically extremely well, which is the conflict between capital and labor. The conflict about how wages are determined and the fact that if you raise the wage, you'll lower profits. And that is something every firm knows. Every firm, if you go to them and say, look, I just came from my economics course and it says, if I raise all wages, then everything will be better, people, consumers will buy more, and you'll be better off. They'll throw you out, and rightfully they should, because in fact, the first step that'll happen is that they will have an equivalent drop in profits. If they could raise their prices, if costs went up, they'd raise their prices before costs went up. That's obvious. Why should you wait? If you can raise it, you raise it to the highest level you can, what your competitors will permit. If your costs go up, you're constrained at that end by competition, and your profits go down. This is, again, an extremely well-established empirical phenomenon. So then, competition is a war. There is an in internal struggle in competition in every firm between labor and capital, between employers and employed. And that is a struggle which pushes, if the employers have the advantage, wages are pushed down, the length of the working day is expanded, the intensity of the working day is expanded, the working week is expanded. It's not something that happened in the past. It happened, it was true in the uh, 19th century in the advanced world. You had 12, 14, 16 hour working days, child labor, very low wages extremely uh, uh, long working week, six days, but is that in the past? Go to China, go to Bangladesh, go to Vietnam. You will see exactly the intrinsic logic of the system playing out. Not because these people are, are uh, less good people than in the West. The difference is in the West, labor won a series of battles that prevented that from happening. And in the developing world, those battles are still just ongoing, they're still beginning. So the difference is not sort of the intrinsic culture and uh, rationality of system, it's the logic of capital which pushes down and therefore the logic of resistance which pushes back up. And it's an extremely well documented history of the battle back and forth between wages, productivity and profits. Um, in my book, I show this battle operating in the United States from 1947 to the present and show how uh, the structure of social structure has an influence on that and also how unemployment has an influence on that. 
Every worker knows that if you're going to fight for something, it's better if there's a, uh, a tight labor market because then they can't go somewhere else. But if there's a loose labor market, then it'll be hard for you to fight for something because they can go somewhere else. Now, the whole point about neoliberalism and globalism was to make the labor market global so that firms could say, well, okay, you want an eight-hour working day and you want vacations and all that, I'll see you in China, and they leave. The iPhone, this iPhone is made in China. Steve Jobs says he cannot make it, could not make it in, in the developed world because the cost would be too high. Now, is he a bad guy? Yeah, he was a bad guy, but that's besides the point. <laughs> he did it because it was cheaper. And that, if you understand that, lots of things fall into play. It's not an imperfection to go for cheaper wages, worse working conditions, environmental degradation. That's the perfection of the system. That's the logic. It's when you intervene in that that you're causing uh, a disturbance in the logic of the system. And once you see this, development also falls into place. And I'm going to try to come back to that. The last thing I want to mention is that I'm going to try to argue that what capitalism does, it is very good at, which is making profit. It's extremely good at making profit. But how do firms make profit? They have to not only find cheaper resources and use them to make profit, but they also have to fight each other, and they have to fight labor so that they have tremendous incentive to lower costs. And if you can't lower it by pushing down on labor and increasing the length of the working day to 16 hours a day and six days a week, if they are restricted by social structure developed over a century of battle, then the other way you can do it is to create new, more advanced technology. Usually, machines replacing labor because machines can work more rapidly. I presume everybody's seen the Charlie Chaplin movie called Modern Times. And if you haven't, you really need to go on YouTube and look this up, where Chaplin's working in a factory and there's an assembly line and they keep getting orders from above. We need more uh, output. We need it faster because there's more profits. You've already employed the workers. The faster they work, the more you get. And it keeps getting faster and faster. And he's trying to keep up. And he's unable to keep up. Eventually, he falls into the assembly line and goes into the machinery. Because in his effort to keep up with the needs of the system, he is sucked into it, literally. Well, on a world scale, one of the things you can see very clearly is a very large pool of unemployed labor. And that pool, you see a pool of employed labor that's cheap, but you also see a large pool of unemployed labor. And that pool is one of the fundamental drivers now of social instability. Because if you're unemployed in capitalism, especially in the poor world, in a developing world, you don't have any other place to go. And it is a source of great misery because you're displaced from what you could have done. You can't work the land, that you don't have any land. You can't work in the factories because they don't need you. There's nowhere for you to go. You're concentrated in the cities, displaced from the lands, and you're literally looking at a deadly, dead-end future. It is perfectly sensible if people under these circumstances begin to agitate for and dream of another way of life. Now, what is plausible is that religion can fill that gap, politics can fill that gap, but as economists, we also have to be able to say, how else can that gap be filled with jobs? It's not enough to say that uh, we can help you feel better in where you are. We also have to say there's a future. And there, an understanding of how the market operates, and therefore, how you can use that up understanding becomes very crucial. I often say that a market is like a nuclear reactor. And if you're committed to capitalism, you're, complete, you're committed to nuclear power. But nobody in their right mind would think that a nuclear reactor runs itself. It's not Bart Simpson who's going to save your life. You better need good engineers and people who understand. If you're going to go with nuclear power, you better know how they work. And you have to understand that there are side effects which are a necessary part of that mechanism. So imagine that you had a textbook in physics, in engineering, that said, nuclear power is perfect. Remember, when I was growing up, they had these comic books, and then nuclear power was perfect. It was shiny, and people flying around in cars, and they were all happy and dressed. They were also all white, but that's another story. <laughs> and, 
they, everybody was happy. It was, everything was by nuclear power. They never told you what was coming out of the back of that nuclear power plant, because in those days, nuclear power was seen the way in economics we now see the market, as something perfect, ideal, and designed to make everybody better off. It ain't so. So in my book, the emphasis is on the idea of competition, conflict, and uh, the fact that persistent inequalities and booms and busts as recurrent outcomes. Now, this is a very important theoretical point, but it's also important historically. If you have a system in which everybody makes their decision on what to produce on their own guess about what's going to happen, which is how production takes place, by the way. 50% or more of firms in the first five years go out of business because they're wrong. But that's how you do it. You make a guess and you do it. How are your guesses going to mesh? The fantasy we are peddled in economics, in orthodox economics, is that somehow these will mesh automatically and we call this general equilibrium. There is no such thing. The mesh comes about because the discrepancies have to be reconciled. And they're reconciled by overshooting and undershooting. The balance comes from offsetting errors. So you get a boom, and the boom is not consistent with the base, with the foundations, the fundamentals, and that boom it then eventually collapses, comes back down, it shoots below the fundamentals, and now you have a bust. And as you recover from the bust, you go back and forth. That's not just my idea. It's obviously Smith, Ricardo, Marx, but this is also George Soros's theory of reflexivity, which is that it's in the nature of, of social life, especially in capitalism, to overshoot and undershoot, and that's just the way the system achieves its balance. So we have to build that in to the story from the start. Uh, my book is a long book, it's a big book, and it's because I chose to develop the alternate framework entirely rather than to in parts, because I wanted to make the argument that this is a coherent alternative framework. So let me say a little bit about the other alternative framework that we have on, on the left, and that's post-Keynesian economics. Now, if you've studied economics, I assume everybody's had a micro course, yeah? Is it safe assumption here? Everybody's had microeconomics? No? Okay. No, okay. Well, if you do, and when you do, you will be presented with a, a model of, of perfect capitalism with perfect consumers, perfect firms, optimizing, maximizing, and uh, uh, general equilibrium, if you get that far in the course. And sensibly, when you look at the real world, it's nothing like that. So the sensible response is to say, well, we don't have competition anymore. We have monopoly. We don't have perfect consumers. We have asymmetric information, or we have uh, people are not smart enough to do it. So that the idea becomes that you think you're moving towards reality by accepting this framework and modifying it. But that is, in my opinion, a big mistake because you're starting from a dead end and you're now trying to make the uh, story better by adding wrinkles into it. And a wrinkled dead end is not a good place to be, in my opinion. You have to start somewhere else. So the post-Keynesian tradition has been focused on two things, the genuine emphasis and recognition that effective demand is crucial and matters, and the other side, which is the dependence on the idea of imperfect competition. But I argue in the book at some length, and I do this by examining the arguments of the, the key figures in the theory, um, that imperfect competition is a trap because it's tied to perfect competition. Imperfect competition is the dual of perfect competition. What we need to have is an analysis of real competition. So the book develops that at great length. Now, I'm saying all these things. I'm, I'll be able to illustrate them a little bit at the end, but just to tell you that the book develops micro and macroeconomic theory uh, from real behavior, real competition, and uses it to explain the empirical patterns and alternate theoretical arguments in neoclassical and post-Keynesian theory of the microeconomics of demand and supply wages and profits, technical change, relative prices of goods and services, the actual empirical things also here, uh, interest rates, bond and equity prices, exchange rates, international trade patterns, balances of trade between countries, growth, unemployment, 
inflation and the persistence and, and determinants of national and personal inequality. Uh, and I do that by trying to show that the same framework can be used to explain these different things. It's a consistent and coherent framework. Uh, and one of the points I make in the book is that there is a recurrent pattern of general crises, what I call crises, but really, if you look over the long period of time, you'll see that patterns of what we call Great Depressions recur, the last one being 2008, and the main point is there'll be another one because the intrinsic driving mechanism is not the government, not who's good in the government, who's bad. It's not Trump versus Clinton or Cameron versus May or Corbyn. It's the structure of the market that drives these things. And that structure creates its own patterns of booms and busts. So let me begin now, let me move quickly to show you some of the patterns, because I'm talking about a system. And I want you to understand the system has very strong properties. This is the structure of my book, the, the um, chapters, and uh, all the lectures in my book are videotaped, and they're on my website called realecon.org. The book is a big book, but it's not that expensive. It's about $37 US, so I don't know what that translates into. 30 pounds or something like that, but Post uh, the same. Yeah, it's so, true. expensive, but not that expensive. It's not as expensive as an econometrics textbook. Look at it that way, right? Um, and I uh, ask you to at least take a look at the website and look at the many people are working on these ideas now. And if you're interested, then you can coordinate and connect to people. People are using the book for their courses. People are using it for their research. Uh, and uh, we're going to be sharing all that. Plus, all the data in my book is there. I not only have all the sources and methods, but the actual data in spreadsheets. So you can take it, you can use it, you can adapt it, and if I've made mistakes, you can find them. So that's an important thing. I want to briefly, uh, oops, is this the wrong sheet? No, it's okay. I want to briefly show you how you can do consumer behavior without any need to do optimizing and utility theory. And here as you're basically making use of the properties of uh, the stochastic properties in any large group. If I were to survey this group and ask you to pick a bundle of commodities, <coughs> I just made them luxury goods and necessary good because in a graph you can only have two dimensions, you can't do n, but mathematically it doesn't matter. So I pick a bundle of goods. What is quite striking, and this is something every business knows, is that even though your individual preferences may change and shift over time, the aggregate is quite stable. And that's because the aggregate is shaped by structure, by your income distribution, by your uh, own personal training, your background, and so the aggregate produces some point. On, this is a budget line, if you've taken micro, luxury good, if you have an income, the maximum you can buy of the luxury good is up here. If you have the maximum of the necessary good is here, any combination in between is on the straight line because your income is given. And there is some combination produced by some population. Now, if you raise that price of one of the goods, let's say the necessary good, so if the price of the necessary good come, goes up, then the amount, the maximum you can buy, y is the income, this is the price, the maximum you can buy goes down because you have the same income and the price of one of the goods has gone up. So the budget line shifts inward and you can show that what happens is that the point also shifts inward. Now what does it mean inward? It means that on average, if the price goes up sufficiently, people will buy less of the good. That's called a downward sloping demand curve. And yet I've made no reference to the motivation of the individuals, only to the stability of an aggregate. And that's one thing we do know. Aggregates have stable properties. From this point of view, you can derive demand curves. And uh, in the book, I show that four different completely <coughs> antithetical representations of individual behavior will give you the same results. One is neoclassical theory. Everybody is rational and uh, completely selfish, and they have utility curves or Cobb Douglas, and they maximize and rationalize, and they get something, and you raise the price, and they get something else. The other one, 
opposite, everybody picks randomly. If I give you a computer tablet and said, look, here are the options, just pick a random number, or your tablet will generate a random number. Well, in the aggregate, that random number would be stable, because we know that if you choose from an aggregate pop, uh, 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 population probability distribution, you get a mean, and you'll have that mean. Well, if I raise the price of one good, that mean will shift down. So that's another result from random behavior. Then there's another set of behavior. We can imagine that people, one set of people are structured by uh, to do what our neighbors around them to do. Think of them as older people. They tend to look to see who's wearing what and dressing and who's talking that way. Another set insists on doing the opposite. This is called mutation, essentially, in, in the biological metaphor. They change their behavior. Well, <coughs> the two groups together in agent-based simulation, and you can produce an average outcome. This is just for the sake of illustration. This is completely different from the standard theory, and yet all of those different models will be in the same demand curves for a luxury good and necessary good here, but in general. And that can be shown generally. Anwar, could you just speak in the mic? Just so oh, sorry, can that can be shown generally from the properties of stochastic uh, for averages. So we can derive all the standard results of microeconomics without any reference to any particular form of behavior. Now, why is this that relevant? Because it opens up the space for us to actually deal with real behavior. So let's look a little bit at how capitalism works when it works, because it doesn't always work and it doesn't work everywhere. This is the GDP, uh, Industrial Production Index of the United States from 1860 to 2010, and what you observe, two things. It grows, and it has a lot of fluctuations. It's turbulent growth, and that's a natural characteristic of the system. Real investment, the same thing, turbulent growth. Real GDP, GDP per capita, this is very important. It rises over time, not in the smooth way that we often build into models, but it does rise over time. And that's precisely where, why it's successful. People are breaking down the walls to get in, because here it's been a success. And I want to talk later about why it's not been a success elsewhere, not necessarily. Uh, these are the fluctuations around the trend. And just to tell you, that these begin in 1831 to 1862. These are business cycles. And you'll see this great event in the middle that was called the Great Depression of the 1840s. And that was uh, an event. Now we move to another period of time, 1867 to 1902, another period. And again, you see the fluctuations back and forth. And there's an event in the middle called the Great Depression of 1873 to 1893. It was called the Long Depression in its day. Then another period, 1903 to 1939, again, an event called the Great Depression of 1929. Now the point is, capitalism has changed a lot since the 1800s, between the 1700s, and yet these events recur. And part of the book is to explain why they recur, why they are inherent in the logic of the system. I'm gonna skip over some things here and I want to do one more thing, which is inflation. Uh, if we look at the price index in the UK and the US from 1780 to the present, you'll notice something very striking. The price index has, I don't know if this will show here, does it here? Yeah, okay. The, the, you can see that big, this is 1780, and you can see in both countries these long waves. You see these? These long waves are what Kondratiev called the long wave, and they exist, uh, and they seem to exist until about 1940. Then what, in 1940, you get inflation in both countries. In fact, you get it everywhere in the capitalist world, inflation. Something changed, and we need to be able to explain that. So the book has a section on the theory of inflation. But important point, the starting point here in 1780 is essentially the same as in 1940. So there was no inflation in the capitalist world as a whole. There were isolated cases, of course, we, we do know that. But in the center countries, there was no inflation until the post-war period. And that is something important to understand because that's another question about how it comes about given that the system has certain properties. Now here's another one. 
If I take this previous one, which is prices expressed in US dollars and British pounds, and I express them instead in gold, which is how Kondratiev does it in the back of his book, then something remarkable happens. These are pri golden prices. UK prices expressed in gold, US prices expressed in gold, and now you see these long waves? You see them here? You see, these are peaks due to wars, but you see the waves. And now we've come to the 1940s, where previously the pattern disappeared, but now the pattern is still there. And in fact, uh, this is 2000 here and 2010 here. What this tells us is that these long waves continue to exist. You just have to look in the right place for them, so to speak. But something more important. In every one of the down phases of the long wave, there's an economic crisis, 1825. Down phase here, 1847. Down phase here, the Great Depression of 1873 to 1893. Down phase here, the Great Depression of 1929 to 1939. And the down phase here, which was called the Great Stagflation, uh, if you read about it, there was uh, a depression covered up by fiscal stimulus and inflation. Now, that led me to ask a question. In 2000, I began to ask myself, how long will it be if this pattern holds, how long will it be before we come to the next phase? Well, if you smooth this data, then the, between the peak and the beginning of the crisis is roughly eight or nine years. Here also, between the peak and the beginning of the crisis, eight or nine years. So I said, okay, here we've come in 2000. By 2003, we knew we had a peak. So in 2003, I was telling my classes, if this, if this pattern holds, then the next one will be 2008, 2009. Well, it was 2007, 2008, which is not bad for such a uh, primitive technique. Um, I want to do one other thing, and then I'm going to move to... If, this is the data from... Uh, uh, Madison, Angus Madison's book, and what you have here is uh, GDP per capita from 1600 to 2000, uh, 1990, because that's as far as his data goes. Here's Western Europe. You see it rising slowly, rising slowly, the, the, the box, but then you see it taking off as capitalism begins to transform England and Europe, and so you get the rise in G GDP per capita. Here is the Western offshoots, the black line. US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. And you see, they have the same uh, pattern. They start rising uh, as they are discovered and colonized, but then they really take off as they are, um, uh, as capitalism comes into its own there. This is Africa, which begins to rise really in the 19th century, but it's sort of takeoff is um, in uh, the 20th century. This is Asia. Uh, Africa takes off and then begins to stagnate on average. And this is Asia. And th this one is Latin America. Now, the point is that capitalism there produces an increase in GDP per capita. That's the point. Not consistent. Africa's is not, at least as of 1990, which is where Madison's data goes. But I want to show you a different implication of that. If I take the richest four countries in this set and the poorest four, and then which ones are the richest and poorest change, then I can see the richest poor benefit greatly from capitalism. Beginning in the uh, 18th century, 19th century is really when the takeoff is, and you see that. And the poorest four, on the other hand, actually end up no better off than they were uh, in 1600, maybe even worse off. So what does that say? Capitalism produces wealth, but it also produces it unevenly, and it in fact suppresses growth some places, and therefore it intrinsically produces inequality. That's the key point. So if I take the ratio of the richest four to the poorest four, that's what it looks like. This is an inequality created by capitalism because all part of the globe then becomes incorporated in capitalism, and you see the tremendous rise in inequality. Now, in the book, I try and show why that is. I try and show how markets work. I try and show that trade, for instance, 
does not bring advantages to both sides. That's a complete lie. And while you've what got five minutes, yeah. is profits to both sides. The two sides are trading because the, the capitalists on two sides are trading, but they're losers. Firms lose, businesses lose, uh, workers lose, and this is what's happening now in all the debates in the US, in the presidential debates. Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump are both right in saying that free trade doesn't benefit uh, many people in the working class. It did not, in fact, and they're absolutely right. Hillary Clinton is right in saying it makes the U.S. richer, but what the U.S. she's talking about, of course, the big corporations that are trading, not the ones who lost, the ones who succeeded. And so they're both right, but if you understand that profit is a dominant thing, you can see that there's nothing that implies that because you have more profit, the environment will be better, people will be better, your family will be better, your job prospects. That is a much more concrete thing, and there are winners and there are losers. So I'm going to wrap up here by uh, saying that what I've tried to argue is that if you approach this from the point of view of real competition and real behavior and real markets, then you find that markets do work. They work at what they're good at, making profit, but it doesn't follow that it provides automatic full employment or benefits for everybody. In fact, we know that's not true. Markets can unemploy people faster than they can employ people, in, and they do in many parts of the world. The big mistake in economic analysis is to think that what's good for profit is good for people, or good for the environment, or good for development. If you understand that that's not the case, then the question becomes to what extent can you channel and, and direct this nuclear reactor and to what extent do you have to talk about giving up nuclear power and talking about solar power instead, right? That's socialism. So let me stop that. We have, we have um, Kostas Lapovitsis here. Um, as our discussants. Uh, Kostas is a professor in economics here at SOAS. Um, he has written on financialization, um, the Eurozone, uh, the political economy of money and finance. Um, and he's, he also uh, writes for The Guardian uh, fairly regularly, although not, uh, not, not recently. Um, and in 2015, in January, fair enough, really, um, in, in January 2015, he was elected to um, the Syriza uh, government, so he's a former MP. Um, and he's just going to talk for um, a few minutes just to draw out some of the themes um, that Anwar has been talking about. So, Costas, sorry about that. <laughs> Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the Department of Development Studies for the invitation, which was rushed, um, but welcome. And it is particularly welcome uh, for me because it um, gives me an opportunity to um, express my appreciation of Anwar Sheikh. Um, when I first uh, came to economics, which now seems like a very long time ago, um, back in the 70s, really. Um, Anwar, Sheikh, Anwar Sheikh was already uh, an established uh, political economist with an international reputation. And um, he was a, one of those people who belonged to that um, generation, the, what I call the um, post-60s, 68 or so on generation that re basically re-established uh, political economy and Marxist political economy as a serious presence um, globally. It's, um, he was one of the people who really formed what is the dominant tradition in political economy today, Anglo-Saxon political economy and Anglo-Saxon uh, Marxism, and for us, for me, and for many others, um, he was a teacher and remains so. Now, the book that we are launching today here at SOAS is a big book, no question, uh, as Anwar himself has uh, acknowledged. It's a statement for our times. It's the product of, of a lifetime, uh, lifetime's work, quite obviously, and um, 
um, it's been a long time in the making. A lot of people have been uh, waiting for this book, uh, not least Anwar himself, as he struggled with the data and the theory. Um, it's clearly a contribution to theory in the first instance. It's a very ambitious book. It starts from first principles and seeks to traverse the entire spectrum from micro to macro in a consistent and coherent way without um, falling prey to neoclassical theory. It contains things that we've seen Anwar develop before. It covers areas of trade, which are things that he developed a long time ago, but areas of micro um, generalities and micro-regularities. And it also covers, for me, areas of competition, which are very interesting, and the, uh, with an emphasis on gain-seeking as the thing that makes capitalism tick. It's also an empirical work, because Anwar made uh, his mark with theory to begin with, but uh, soon much of his work was empirical, and the work of many of his students was equally empirical, and then this output began to emerge from the United States, which was on the how to measure the national income and how to measure profit, and all these things are reference points for all of us in doing empirical work on contemporary capitalism. Now, I can go on for a long time telling you about all these things and how important they are and how this book calls for people to dip in and out, to read consistently, to return to it, and so on, and to emphasize particular areas and to use particular areas as occasion arises. Um, but I'm here as a discussant, and the job of a discussant is also to pose questions. Um, it's also to raise issues, to encourage responses, and to uh, probe more deeply into what the argument um, is. So this is indeed a book about micro-behavior, but it's also, and I don't think I'm the only person in this room who would say that, it's also a book that is about the macro-behavior, the long-term behavior in particular, of the capitalist system, and I think this, this is what will generate a lot of interest among economists and non-economists. And this is pretty much what the second part of the presentation was about. And it was a very strong statement. I will just say one thing here. I could have said many, but I'll just say one thing because I don't want to take too much time and invite Anwar perhaps to consider it in discussion subsequently. It's a very strong statement about a grand cyclical movement of uh, capitalism in terms of prices, but also in terms of output and employment and so on, the real and the nominal, in other words. Um, and it connects this grand cyclical movement to the rate of profit. And um, in the, on, on this basis, there is this argument that perhaps we've entered a new period of long malfunctioning with the crisis of 2007-2009. Now, this, and I think Anwar would be the first to recognize, is basically Kondratiev. This is Kondratiev's theory, and um, he was the one to trace uh, these long waves. Um, other people have discussed them, Ernest Mandel being one of them, but several others. And there is an established tradition in economics uh, that takes in contractive cycles. And I think Anwar has been, um, has contributed to this. What has always puzzled me about contractive cycles, which were discussed extensively for many times, and also in the 1920s, is of course what creates the regularity. Yeah. You can talk about 50 year cycles, but what creates the regularity? Mm, this is a question, and he might or might not answer it now, or he might or might not come up in discussion. The only regularity I could see, and so could others, is basically some kind of bunching of technological uh, innovations, some kind of accumulation of knowledge and a bunching of technological innovations that will create, that will have an impact on productivity and it will affect other, the performance of the capitalist economy generally. Yeah, but why is there a regularity in the bunching of technological innovations? What is it that, that explains that? That's always something that I found um, mysterious about the contractive cycles. Um, so perhaps Anwar can tell us more about how uh, he tackles that and how he deals 
with the impact of that on the rate uh, of profit. I could have raised other issues for discussion again, but I choose not to because I don't want to take your time. I'm sure that you'll have questions to, to ask him directly, and I'm sure he will come back with all the clarity uh, that he has, um, that he has uh, made us uh, accustomed to uh, over the years. So without further ado, I'd like to thank Anwar Sheikh once again for being here, for sh introducing his book to us. And I want to assure him that um, he will continue to be a source of knowledge and inspiration for all of us in London uh, as well as elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Costas. Um, okay, so uh, questions. We have a bit of time, uh, and there are two rowing mics going around. Um, the woman in the green, and then Alessandra down here. Are there rowing mics? <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, when is the next crisis? Uh, <laughs> when is the next crisis? <laughs> And um, talking about frames, uh, everybody's talking about uh, either the nuclear power or the solar power. So uh, what is the road between them and uh, uh, in economics, I mean, not in political. Uh, and uh, what things we have to struggle to, uh, to go there. Thanks, and one in the front here. Thank you very much for the great presentation. I guess my question relates to the politics of inequality that you just touched upon a little bit. You actually uh, suggest that capitalism actually generates inequality intrinsically, and recently there's been a lot of work on inequality as a matter of fact, which however makes an argument about classes, like at least upper classes, making a difference in terms of the process of generation of inequality. And I'm referring here particularly to the work of Thomas Piketty. So I wonder, because in his analysis, he makes a very strong argument that it's because we're moving towards patrimonial capitalism that we observe this increase. So are you suggesting that it doesn't really matter which classes are in the top and the system will generate that intrinsically anyway? Because that, of course, has big implication for what we can imagine in terms of politics to counter these trends. Thanks. Thanks, uh, and we've got one over there. Yeah. Thank you for pre uh, your presentation. Um, uh, so far, I've read uh, m most of your uh, works, and uh, I understood that you are reasoning the capitalist crisis as a consequence of the falling rate of profits, which is an inevitable consequence of the real competition, mechanization, conflicts between capitalist class and uh, working class and conflicts among capitalists and work workers. Um, it is easy to understand that mechanism, but I couldn't find any detailed and concrete, uh, concrete uh, analysis uh, of the consequences of this crisis on microeconomics Macroeconomic variables, for example, uh, investment, for example, uh, industrial production, interest rates, uh, inflation, etc. Yeah, inflation. For inflation, you you wrote, uh, uh, you published uh, articles. I wrote them, but as a as a complete model, I couldn't see. Is it possible to develop a model to understand what is the consequence of capitalist crisis on all macroeconomics, macroeconomic variables. Thank you. Um, we've got one over here. One more, I think okay. okay. this will take some time to... Thanks. I would like one a more. bit more clarification uh, on the issue of competition and conflict. Uh, it, it appeared to me that you have placed together uh, conflict between capital and conflict between labor. I mean, both in Marx and in reality, the two things are totally different in that the one type of conflict is meant to be antagonistic, as we say, the other is meant to be synagonistic, so to speak. 
You mentioned Harvard Business Review. In recent years, it has been recognized that capital has moved in what we call today competition, which really is uh, uh, the English version of the word synagonistic uh, in Marx, that is competing and cooperating together. And I find it fascinating that even all the latest economists, not exactly left-wing magazines, are suggesting that the main problem, the main issue today in today's capitalism is actually collusive oligopoly, which is monopoly, in effect. And uh, with the added dimension on finance capital contributing and actually creating uh, some sort of global monopoly through some of the major companies which are funded for 15 years with losses until they manage to actually uh, monopolize the whole globe in one sense. So I'm a bit worried about, I'm, I'm a bit wo wondering about this, your ideas on this type of topic. You did mention monopoly on, on the one side, but the other side, for me, the issue of inter, inter, in, inter-organizational versus intra-organizational competition and conflict and cooperation and how they are related is key to realizing what's happening going forward, and I, I haven't seen you touching these things. Thank you. Should we take them all? Um, well, up to you. I don't know if I can answer them all. Okay, yeah. Sure. No, no, no. I mean, it's... Yeah, but, okay. Thank you for the presentation. I want to ask you two things. One, which is the role of money in your theory as a value in itself or just an exchange value? And which is the role of, of, the, of bank, of central banks and commercial banks, both in crisis and in periods of expansions? Because, for example, Schumpeter related on crisis and uh, on the role of bank. So, which is how your theory relates to this? Thank okay. you. Just one more in this round, um, so that woman over there. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. I have two questions. Um, the first one is, um, really, would you say that you are contributing to keeping the Marxist political economy theory alive today and applying it to the changes that happened in the capitalist system, but with the same principles of Marxism? Um, that, uh, and my second question is that, could you please elaborate a little bit? You mentioned something about the capitalist system today creating big poles of unemployed people and that causes the major uh, instabilities that we have, social instabilities, and that gap should be filled. It is filled either with religion or politics. Could you maybe just say a bit more about that? Thank you. Okay, let me... Okay, these are, cover a lot of ground, but there's some similarities, so let me see if I can. In the book, um, in the book, I focus on the role of profitability in regulating demand and supply rather than the long waves. But I had published that elsewhere, and I decided once a book reached a thousand pages, there's some things I had to stop talking about. That was one of them. Uh, but Here's a very important issue. I was concerned about showing that the treatment of demand and supply can be incorporated into the framework of profitability. And that's important because the two interact. So for instance, if we say that the, we want to stimulate the economy, then by so doing, we hope we'll raise employment. If we raise employment, uh, as the labor market gets tighter, wages may rise. If they rise relative to productivity, then the profit rate will fall because if the wage share is rising, the profit rate will fall. That falling profit rate will undermine growth because it's no secret that the thing firms care about is profits. That's what Keynes says and Marx says, but that's also what the Harvard Business Review says. So therefore, there is a limit to fiscal stimulus. And one of the things I show in some detail in the book is that I want to take on the Keynesian and Koletskian idea that demand is autonomous. 
and independent. It is not, because demand and supply come from the two sides, fundamentally, of profitability. When a firm decides to make a decision to produce, in that same moment, it has to make a decision to buy raw materials, which is the demand for raw materials. It has to hire workers, which is the demand for their consumption goods. It has to make um, buy machinery for expansion. That's a demand for investment goods. And has to pay out all the people that it borrowed money from. That's a rentier's income from which comes their consumption demand. So demand and supply, because in that act of producing the supply, it creates a demand, are from the same root. It doesn't follow that they match, obviously, because when you're buying, you're not interested in whether they can sell. And when you're producing, you're interested in whether you can sell, but they're not. So that is what causes those ups and downs. And it also causes a fundamental limit to fiscal stimulus. So that's what I chose to focus on in the end of the book. And in the end of the book, I have a very detailed analysis of the current crisis. And that detailed analysis is showing that the current crisis was not directly call, caused by a falling rate of profit. In fact, the data I have, uh, perhaps I can go back and just show you what that looks like. I skipped, I skipped over this, but um, <clears throat> this is the data for the corporate rate of profit in the United States from 1947 to 1979, uh, 19, 2011. And you see, and this is official data from the Bureau of Economic Analysis, and no mystery in it. You see a downward trend. You also see fluctuations due. This is the great Vietnam War and great society boom of Lyndon Johnson. You can see the trend going down, then this big boom, <coughs> then return. But from this point on, the profit rate is stabilized. So it's not true that the crisis, when it came, was due to a falling rate of profit directly. What I argue in the book is that that stabilization took place by reducing workers' wages relative to productivity. And that is, from the Marxist point of view, an increase in the rate of surplus value. It stabilizes the profit rate. But there's more. Because investment is determined not by just the profit rate, but the difference between the profit rate and the interest rate. And one of the remarkable things that was done in this same era was that the interest rate was driven down through central bank policy. That someone asked the question, what's the role of money in central banks? I spent a lot of time discussing the role of money and the role of central banks. But here, the actual effect of that was to you have a falling rate of profit, which then is stabilized by an attack on the welfare state and labor. That's Reagan and Thatcher. But the interest rate, which has had its own path, is now reduced almost down to zero. So the gap between the two widens, and you get a boom. But that boom goes hand in hand with the speculative bubble, because uh, credit is so cheap that people can borrow and speculate and go across the world. It lubricates the spread of financial capital across the whole world. But it also sets up the crisis. And I'm not the only one who said this. is George Soros's argument, by the way. The bubble gets its own negation. It collapses in 2008. So there is a very detail. And I talk about the Great Depression and lots of other things. That's chapter 16 of the book. or. Yeah, chapter 16 of the book, which is analysis of the forces of profitability, which is not the same thing as a falling rate of profit. And that's an important thing to understand. Uh, someone asked about when the next crisis is, and the answer is it depends on whether these patterns continue to hold. Japan has been in stagnation for a long time, but it didn't allow its financial system to collapse and the un uh, unemployment to rise. The US in that same period coming out of that did allow unemployment to rise, so did the UK. So the, the reaction of countries is a more concrete factor, but the forces that underlie that are exactly the forces of profitability. Japan's profitability is stagnant, but its economy is stagnant too, but they're not allowing those the, that stagnation to manifest itself as a crisis. So what they have is stagnation. And I can't say that that's worse than having unemployment and having people uh, displaced and, you know, from jobs and from life, which is work is life. So um, 
Much of the book is spent on arguing that the theory of real competition is not just a theory, but it's empirically correct. And that the profit rate is actually equalized across industries. Now, what I make the argument in the book is that the rate of profit which is equalized is the rate of return on new investment. Not the average profit rate, but the rate of return on new investment. And I show how they can be measured. And that's the same argument, by the way, in Keynes and Marx. It's a rate of return new investment. So again, this is something I raced through, but I skipped. But if you go to the rate of return on new investment, this is average profit rates in the OECD countries, in, I mean, sorry, in the US in manufacturing by different industries. The industries are listed here. And you can see the average profit rates cluster. They follow certain pattern, but they do not equalize. So then one could say, well, their difference is really monopoly power. That's a standard explanation in the Marxist and the post-Keynesian tradition. I argue there is no evidence for systematic monopoly power at all. Because if you look at the incremental rate of return, which is a rate of return on new investment, you see very clearly the dark line is the average, and you see how they go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I have a lot of theoretical and empirical work in the book about profit rate equalization. So I don't believe in the monopoly stage of capitalism, and that's why I said my work is different from post-Keynesian economics, but also from the bulk of the Marxist tradition. And then one can ask, how did the post-Keynesian economists and the Marxist tradition come to believe that what they saw was monopoly? And the answer they give themselves is that competition is what you find in orthodox economic textbooks. The editors of Monthly Review now literally said that the definition of competition is that given by Milton Friedman. Is that really plausible? Milton Friedman is the same as Karl Marx. I mean, these people supposedly read Marx. How can it be that competition, the, uh, the misrepresentation of competition in Milton Friedman is what Marx had in mind? But that is necessary for them to say that because they then say, if I see firms that have any size, that's imperfect competition. If I see a big firm, that's concentration and centralization, which means the end of competition. I argue throughout in the book, there is no empirical evidence supporting the idea that scale or size has any impact, if you observe it moving over time, any impact on profitability. In fact, sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. One of the best known economic phenomena in business, in the business literature, is that bigger firms have lower profit rates. Well, if they're bigger, and presumably that's their monopoly power, how come they have lower profit rates? And it turns out, if you look at the data, Small firms have, some of them have very high profit rates and others have very low profit rates, so they have a big dispersion. The average is high. The big firms have a narrow dispersion and the average is low, but the small firms have a huge death rate. If you adjust for risk, survival risk, it turns out the two rates are roughly similar. And that is data taken from the business literature. It's the CompuStat database, and you can do that. All the data is in the book, as I said. So, I don't believe that capitalism is run by monopoly power. And that answers the other question, why did I not talk about the fact that in capital there is no longer an antagonism? That's because I think there is an antagonism. I think it's ongoing and all the time, and sometimes it's a cold war, sometimes it's a hot war, sometimes it's about resources, sometimes it's about turf, brands, but it's an ongoing war. Uh, and so I, I think that it's not just the relation between capital and labor, which the Marxist tradition tends to focus on, but also the antagonism among capitalists. And that means among capitalists in the developing world and in the center. You don't think Chinese capitalists are hostile to American capitalists? Oh, they certainly are. And guess what? American capitalists are really hostile to German capitalists. The fact that they have some commonalities doesn't mean that they wouldn't cut each other's throat if they get a chance. The images of the mafia, not a ballet. The mafia, sometimes they sit and have dinner, but don't turn your back, whatever you do, because you never know what the next outcome will be. Uh, inequality. 
in the data I showed you was the inequality among nations, but in the book, I also discuss personal inequality. There's inequality of wages and inequality of, of uh, 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 property income. Mm. And those inequalities have different laws, and I show how the principle of profitability and financialization is able to explain exactly the Gini coefficient in different parts of the world, and in, in the US particularly, I focus on the data there, I can explain the degree of inequality from two things, the movement to the profit wage ratio and the degree of financialization of incomes that takes place uh, in the 2008 period. So we've run out of time. I have other things to say, but let me stop here. Uh, the book has a lot of material I didn't even mention, laws of money, interest rates, stock prices, uh, inflation, um, I urge you, if you're interested, to look at that web page to see what other people are doing. If you can afford to buy the book, I would be very grateful. I don't make a lot of money from it, but maybe you could buy me a couple of beers at least from, <laughs> from the sales here. And my main goal is to get people to think and talk about an alternate place for economists to approach the world. That's my main interest. So anything that helps do that, is from my point of view a success. Thank you.